Welcome to the third webinar in our fall series called Beginnings and Endings, Gluten-Free Holiday Appetizers and Desserts, hosted by the Celiac Research Program at the Harvard Medical School and the National Celiac Association. I'm Lee Graham, Executive Director of the National Celiac Association, serving the gluten-free community since 1993. Food pantries have been telling us that the demand for gluten-free food is two to three times more for gluten-free families than ever before. And we've heard stories of moms and dads skipping meals so their kids with celiac disease can eat gluten-free. The launch of NCA's Feeding Gluten-Free Initiative in response to this need has been tremendous. Up to now, we've shipped over $850,000 worth of gluten-free food to food pantries in 49 states, serving over 250,000 children and adults. Despite the food we continue to deliver, there are so many more families who need help from our celiac community. I hope during this time of Thanksgiving, you'll consider a donation to this important program at nationalceliac.org. Thank you. For today, you're welcome to ask general questions through the Q&A feature, which is located on the bottom right corner of your Zoom screen. If you're still struggling to connect with us, tech support is available if needed at digitalmedia@partners.org or by phone 857-282-6470. Also, this session is being recorded and will be available for viewing on NCA's website, nationalceliac.org. I'm honored today to introduce our featured chef, Denise Baron Herrera began as an executive chef and is now the vice president of operations for Burton's Grill and Bar. She received an AOS in culinary arts in 1995 and a BS in food service management in 1998 from Johnson and Wales University. Chef Herrera started her restaurant management career with Houston's restaurants in 1998. In 2004, she partnered to help create the Contemporary American Grill concept. Chef Herrera is an active member of the Massachusetts Restaurant Association's executive board, along with being a member of the Boston chapter of Les Dames de Scoffier. Chef Herrera was one of 16 people selected to participate in the inaugural Culinary Richmond and Innovation Program, a culinary leadership program from the Culinary Institute of American and Hormel Foods. She also helped launch a pilot program, Esperanza Cooks, The Recipe for Life, and has fe been featured often in television and in print. Welcome, Chef Denise. Can't wait to go on this journey of food with you. Take it away. Thank you, Lee. Very excited to be here and welcoming back my second year. So we have a lot of cooking to do today and um, I just am very excited to say that Burton's Grill and Bar and Red Heat Tavern really pride themselves on serving the gluten-free, but also the allergy community. We go above and beyond every day to make sure that we provide safe and healthy meals for everyone. So today we're gonna start with some beginnings and afters. Um, and that's really for anything that you wanna do, but um, we're focusing in on the holiday cooking. So there's gonna be some holiday seasonings and flavors along these recipes. So we're gonna start by making our butternut squash soup and it's gonna be garnished with a rum buttercream. And I like to serve this um, in a small demi toss because you can pass them around as hors d'oeuvres, you can start them in as an amuse bouche in the beginning of the meal. So we're gonna start with roasting our butternut squash. I take um, small diced pieces and I season it with a little bit of salt and pepper and black salt, black pepper and olive oil. I then toss it, make sure it's nice and coated well. And then we're just gonna put it right in the oven. Now, since we have so much that we wanna to accomplish today, I've gone ahead and speeded up some of the, um, the things that we're gonna do. So the squash goes in 350 degrees. If you have a convection oven, turn it on high fan. If you do not have a convection oven, turn your oven up to 400 degrees. So you get that browning. That's really what we're looking for. So when you roast your squash, you have nice caramelization and it brings the sugars out. How we're going to turn our usually yeah. takes 20 minutes, 20 minutes. Yes. So I'm going to have my sauce pot heating up now. 
I'm gonna add my butter, melt that down. And you just wanna keep it going. Um, this is a fairly quick process, especially when the squash is nice and warm and it comes out of the oven. You're not trying to brown the butter, you're just trying to melt it? Correct, just trying to melt it a little bit. Yep. I'm just gonna speed us along here. Now I'm going to use a vegetable stock in here so it doesn't overpower the flavor. Um, and it can be vegetarian if you want. Um, we have some dairy-free substitutes to replace the heavy cream, which you can use um, coconut cream. You can also use a silken tofu and um, coconut cream mixture. That helps um, the viscosity of the soup a little bit as well. Um, what I also like about this soup is you can change it um, for the season. So if you want it to add ginger to it to make it a little bit spicier, you can add ginger and apple to it, which also has a really nice flavor. I would change the garnish out at that point in time. I would not use the rum buttercream. I would use a different garnish, um, more so like cilantro. Um, and then the, another option too, it also to add red curry paste to it. So this is always a good base that you can use and jazz it up and change it around. I'm gonna add my squash in. Okay, I've even tried putting, uh, Denise, I've even tried putting those um, croutons you helped us make last year. I've cut them really small and put them on top of the soup. People love them. You're absolutely right. They, that would be fantastic on here because what I love about those croutons is once they get a little bit in that soup, they, they get, you have the crunchy texture on top and then that soft texture on the bottom. And it creates a really nice dimension in a velvety, velvety soup. That's a, that's a really good suggestion. Mike. Yeah. It's been a hit at our house. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm working on an induction burner today. So things can be always challenging when you're in a new kitchen and trying different things. So we just take our time because one thing I've learned about cooking is patience. It's really important that you don't rush things because if you rush it, you're not gonna get the desired result that you want. So as Lee said, I don't wanna brown the butter. I just wanna melt the butter. And so that's coming on up now to be almost melted. And once it's 100% melted, I'll add my, my uh, squash. The other thing, you, if you wanted to replace the butter, you can use a, uh, a non-dairy butter, or you can also use olive oil too in this recipe. That's fine. I, I do like the butter just because of the flavor and the richness that it adds to the overall depth of the dish. But I understand everybody has different dietary preferences and, and, and likes. So now we're gonna add our squash. I'm gonna heat that up a little bit. And it's important that the squash is roasted through. So when I'm checking the doneness of the squash, I'll take one of the more blonder pieces and I will I'll knife test it or I'll squeeze it um, to see how, if the texture is done all the way through. Because if it's not, then you're gonna get um, really chunky pieces in your soup and that's not what you want. You want a, a very smooth consistency. If you do find that at the end you have some underdone pieces or it's not the same texture you want, you can always run that through a china cap and then that will pull out any of those imperfections that you have in the soup. So there are always ways to kind of fix some of the things that you wanna do. Denise, what's a china cap? A china cap is a strainer. So they make all different size strainers, a, a chinois gross, a chinois fine. Um, so they have different um, hole sizes. Um, so I would recommend the medium size because you're really going to capture um, any of the bigger pieces that are in there. Thank you. So just bringing this up now. I'm going to create a little hole in my area and I'm going to add my shallots. Now I like to use shallots. Um, as I feel it has a, a, a nice round flavor of a little bit of that garlic and a little bit of that onion in there. Just making sure my pot's getting hot for us. Now 
So the shallots are going to um, turn translucent while the squash is also heating up and cooking around the sides. So you definitely want this to go for a good three to five minutes so you get that texture. I would want a little bit of a higher flame when I'm working on that. So that'd be one thing at home. This will go a little bit faster if you're not on an induction burner. Yeah, I find that's the sort of frustration of being on an induction is it seems to have its own way of heating up. It's not what I asked it to do. <laughs> well, you're absolutely right because I tested it before on the show and it was scorching hot. And now that it's, you know, we're here, it's not. <laughs> of course. But that's just the way it works sometimes and you just kind of go with the flow. So it's just going to keep heating. So in an in a spirit of time, because I want to keep everybody going, I'm going to push this process along a little bit sooner than I would. But the, the shallots should definitely be a little more translucent. And I'm going to push them down at the bottom. Okay. Keep heating them up. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to sprinkle a little bit of brown sugar in on top and my salt. Now, some people would can substitute maple syrup in this as another option if you don't want to use any brown sugar. I've also made that when I had to do it for a diabetic friend of mine. Mm -hmm. I use the um, just imitation sugar uh, oh. half a packet just to throw that in and they seem fine with it. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Because the, the, the squash itself has so much sweetness in it anyway, that that's yes, really what you're going after. Um, cause you don't want to underplay the squash. One, one thing that I have found out is because everybody wants squash soup almost in September and October, and it's actually better in November, December, and January because the squash has a chance to kind of mature a little bit more, um, and sweeten. I find when it's um, right green, I call it, right off of the vine, it doesn't have that same sweetness. That's when it goes into cold storage and it starts to develop more of that sugar content. So I'm mixing that all up. I'm gonna add my salt now. And this doesn't call for a lot of salt in this, in this um, step right now, it's, it's a quarter teaspoon. But um, depending upon what type of vegetable stock, or if you wanted to substitute chicken stock in there, you can. Um, that would give you a little bit more of a, um, depending upon low sodium or high sodium, you would need to um, finish it with, your fl with the flavor that you want. So you can always season to taste at the end. All right. I'm in the same camp as you are, Denise, and then I've served that um, with the little croutons you taught us how to make just before Thanksgiving. And mm -hmm. it sort of was a, in a small, tiny container, but it was a great way to sort of segue from having the cocktails to then actually getting into the dinner. Yeah. Well, I'm going to change my pot out a little bit so I get a, a better uh, cook on this induction. So I can keep things going as quick as we need to. Awesome. Thanks, Chef. So once you have your squash cooking up in here, and I'm using a slotted spoon. I like slotted spoons because I also feel that that kind of breaks the texture up as I'm going through it sometimes in certain dishes that I use. Now I hear the sizzle. I love the sizzle of cooking. So much better. Oh, that took with fire. We can hear it talking back to you. So rule one, make sure you have the right pan for an induction burner. So then I have um, almost three quarts of um, stock here. I'm only going to put two in right now. Um, then I'm going to add another half quart at the, at the end. But this will also help you understand what type of viscosity do you want on your soup? Some people like it a little bit thinner. Some people like it a little bit thicker. So it really will depend on what you're going after. If I'm going to use the soup as a starter, 
then I don't want it to be super thick because I want them to be able to graze on other items. So I'm looking for that to be on the, on the medium to, to thin side. If it's my main course, I'm going to have it a little bit thicker because it's going to be a little bit hardier. And that means that you have more of that um, butternut, the squash in there. So while this is coming to a boil, I'm going to show you how to make the rum buttercream. So you can do this in a, um, a stand-up mixer with a paddle. You can use a hand mixer. I prefer to use a uh, immersion blender just because I find that it's easier and for me for transport right now. So I'm gonna take my one cup of heavy cream. Again, you can use the silken tofu and um, uh, coconut cream equal parts in this option, or you can use full, flat, full fat unsweetened coconut cream if you're looking for a dairy free option. Now this is going to be, I use Bacardi um, rum because it is certified gluten-free, so I do like that. Then I take my immersion blender. And the trick about the immersion blender is you, you just kind of lift it up and lift it down. With heavy cream, you don't want to over, overdo it because it's just going to turn into butter for us. So I'm just going to go up and down until I have a nice thick cream. And I'm almost there. There we go. So the rum buttercream is done. My soup is coming along nicely. And then once this comes up to a boil, what I'm gonna do is take the same immersion blender and then I'm gonna blend it. Thank you. So again, as I'm looking at time, I just wanna be respectful of everything and get everything done for you today. So I'm gonna blend it on up. Now, if you have a, um, a blender at home, you can use it in a blender. The one thing I don't like about blenders and hot is that it can, it can splash up and burn you. That's why I do prefer the um, immersion. You're gonna blend this for quite a bit, okay? So it gets to the right viscosity for you. And I'm moving it all around. I'm lifting it up, I'm pushing it. All right. I'm gonna turn my stove top down. Now it's a little thick for me. So I'm going to add a little bit more of my veg stock. Mix it on in. And that's a better viscosity because I still need to add my cream. So now I'm gonna add the cream into there. I forgot and the reason why I like the slotted spoon is I don't have to pull a whisk out and um, dirty another utensil. I can just use the same spoon to really as whip in the soup. <clears throat> Denise, I wanted to ask you a question of when you put the squash into the oven, do you use any kind of oil on the tray or do you use a nonstick spray? So I'll use, um, I oil the, the squash, but I don't necessarily put anything on the pan. If anything, I actually use the back of a, like a hamburger spatula and then scrape that off 
Um, mm. Because sometimes I find that if I put oil on the tray, it goes to burning before it goes to caramelization. So I want that natural caramelization to happen. That's a great idea. Thank you. All right. Now the soup is going to be done. This is one of the fan favorites at my family. Uh, my family really enjoys this soup when I make it for them at home. Now, as I was mentioning, the way that I wanted to present them is in these small little cups. Take my small ladle, ladle them on in. I always think it's fun just to have um, from doing a dinner party, um, smaller tastings of things throughout the evening. So people don't fill up on one item and they get a nice sampling of what we have to offer. Okay. Such a great idea. I love the small cups. I'm gonna put a little round buttercream on top. Then I'm going to garnish it with scallions. So I'm using scallions today. If I wasn't making the smoked trout dip, I would use chives, um, as I find they're a little bit more delicate. But since I already have scallions in my ingredient list, I didn't want to have to buy two of the same, technically, item. And that is the rum buttercream. And then the, the cream really melts down into the soup so it creates a really nice flavor profile. Mmm. I love that soup. Nicely balanced. That looks so good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the next thing that we're gonna make is smoked trout dip with house-made gluten-free crackers. And, um, I really enjoy these crackers immensely. I, I find myself snacking on them a lot. And, and just so you know, I am not, um, I don't have celiac and I don't have to have a gluten-free diet, um, but I do enjoy eating uh, gluten-free. And when I make something as delicious as these crackers and find myself eating them, I know it's a, a home run recipe. So in my bowl, I have my, um, my gluten-free flour. I have kosher salt sugar, and baking powder. And then what I'm gonna do is get my butter and my, my uh, water, okay? I have a refrigerator under, underneath me, so I kept them nice and cold through this time. So if anybody had made biscuits in the past, um, this is, or shortbread, this is very similar process where you're gonna cut the butter into the flour. So I have it nice and uh, diced small. Do you have a, a flour that you like to use? Do you have a combination or just rice flour or? So I like to use an all purpose flour for this recipe. And then when I, um, I'm gonna talk to you about the whoopie pies, I like to use the, like the cake flour, the gluten-free cake flour for those. Um, but I do try to use um, an equal ratio um, gluten-free flour uh, when I'm making it. So it makes baking really easy. Um, we at the restaurant do not have any um, all-purpose flour other than gluten-free flour in our restaurants. It's just a, a commitment that I made so many years ago that um, there's no need to have cross-contamination. We can create really great food from um, gluten-free ingredients. Uh, we cook with whole whole ingredients. So there's, it's easy to make sure that they are safe uh, for the allergen friendly community. And will the cake flour be different? And what way would that be different from your all purpose gluten free flour? It's a little, it's, it's silkier. Um, it's, it's definitely not as sometimes you find coarse gluten free flour. So the flour that I'm working with today is not as coarse as I've, I've used in the past, which I really like, because it lends itself to a good texture. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think more of the, what is it, there's a the fine grind rice flour and then there's a regular one. There's a big difference between the two. It is, and it's, and it's good for different applications. You know, I'm not um, as concerned when I mix my, when I'm using a, like a fry batter. So for our fried foods, we use um, corn flour and cornstarch um, to help create that nice, crispy, crunchy exterior. Yeah, um, when we, yeah. We opened the company and I didn't have, I was using a regular, um, you know, a glutenful uh, flour back in the day before I really emerged into the gluten-free cooking. And um, when I changed it over as a whole process to make sure every one of our fryers was gluten-free, I actually was um, pleasantly surprised that I had better results with the corn flour cornstarch mix than I did with a true um, flour, like a gluten flour. So I was, I was really happy with that because I got a better product. It's nice to hear that something is really positive out of our flour. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So now I'm going to take um, my water. So I have ice cold water here and I'm going to use um, 12 to 14 tablespoons in here. One of the things that I would say is go less first, because what I have learned is if I, I was using a pastry flour for this recipe and the pastry flour um, didn't, it, it needed less water. So now I don't do as much water. I, I check it and then I do more. So one, two, Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to take my spoon and just kind of start working the, the dough together. Someone has asked a question of back to the soup. Mm -hmm. and if you can use other kinds of vegetables in it instead of just the squash. Yeah, carrots, um, celery, -ac, um, like I said, you can even use apples, you can use pears. Yeah, I think um, the only thing I worry about is the color. That yes. if you're using more of a green vegetable, you tend to have this olive green look that's not quite as exciting as one of the more um, orange or yellow looks that we have. Correct. All right, so I'm going to go one more spoonful. Then I'm just going to bring this together. I'm just going to start to knead it. And I'm not kneading it to, to work the, the dough. I'm just kneading it to bring it all together because there's a lot of moisture in here and I just wanna make sure that I get it all over the place. Now, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna put a piece of plastic wrap on this and I'm gonna let it set for 15 minutes. So when I'm getting it, I'm just gonna put it into like a little bit of a disc shape. Thank you. And then I will cover it and put it right down. I have another question that came in, Denise. Um, someone is asking if there are different sizes of blenders, immersion blenders, or is there only one brand that we should buy or what? No, there's all different sizes, all different. Some have variable speeds on them. Um, I like a variable speed because I, I sometimes I want it um, to rotate faster. Um, so I definitely will pick the rotating speed that has high, low, and then a variable. And then this is what we use in the restaurants. So this is, <laughs> this is the Mac Daddy of all sizes of immersion blenders. <laughs> so they do get them very large if you need them. That would really scare my husband if I brought that out. <laughs> <laughs> Scares a lot of people actually. But I, I know there are lots of, I have one at home, but I'm not home. So I can't look up what size it is, but there are a lot of them out there in any of the stores that carry kitchen equipment, I think. They are, absolutely. So now we're gonna make the trout dip. And the trout dip, um, this is one of my favorite recipes, actually. I made it and I did not think my kids who are um, 10 and eight years old would love it as much as they do, but they, I have to uh, like portion out how much they can have because they absolutely love it. So I use a smoked trout. I like using the smoked trout because um, it it's, has the right oil content. Some people might want to use a bluefish or a mackerel or a smoked salmon. That just has a higher um, fat content. 
So that's why I do like the trout. So we're going to do two different things. Um, I have a dog at home, so I like to save the skins. I actually put them in a low oven um, and I dry them out and they're very good for them. They enjoy that immensely. And then in the trout, they do have bones. So I like to take a V cut right down where the bones are to pull it out. Now, the trout is not cheap, okay? So sometimes I, I pull them out with my fingers so that I make sure I get them all because I don't wanna just waste it. So I'm coming on through, I'm pulling the trout out. Now, I have tried this without pulling the bones out. And I will tell you, those bones do not process very well. So while I know it's kind of a pain of a process, you're gonna be thanking me that you won't have to eat the bones in the trout. So I would highly recommend not doing that. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take, I have four fillets of trout, which is gonna equal my two pounds. Two of those fillets of trout, I'm going to um, break up and put into my, my chopper, my food processor. So you can feel where the bones are in the trout, and then I just pull them off to the side. My eight-year-old really likes helping me pull the bones out. She thinks it's a lot of fun. So that's a ta task I give her. I have another question that came in, Denise, on the soup, and they want to know if they can cook the squash pieces on parchment paper. Can you still get the same browning? You can, yes. Great. Definitely parchment, not wax. Just remember that. Yeah, right. Okay. And do you know if you use sweet rice flour in the cake flour for the whoopie pies? I don't know what exactly rice flour I do use in that because um, it is a bit of a, of a blend in, in, the, in, the, in the brand that I do use. So in addition to the, um, the trout that I'm going to add in here, I'm going to add a softened cream cheese that I've had here for... Um, a period of time getting out to room temperature. Gonna add sour cream for that tang. I'm gonna add two tablespoons of mustard. I like to use a, um, a Dijon mustard in this. You can also use a country grain if you choose to. I try to stay away from the whole grain because of the balls in it. It doesn't really uh, blend up very well in this, this, this dish. So you want something that's already uh, blended for you. Two tablespoons of lemon juice. And I'm gonna use our Red Heat Tavern green sauce that my, my chef Eric LeBlanc made for me, <laughs> which is really delicious. So I use a green chili sauce. I'm gonna put two teaspoons of that in. And I'm gonna process this until it's nice and smooth. I go back and forth on the grind and the chop on here. Are there other kinds of chili sauce that you can use that we could buy? Uh, yeah, so um, there, there, there are green ones on the shelf um, that major manufacturers do make. Okay. Yeah. He just made me a homemade one, so I, I like that one. So this I'm going to make sure that it's nice and um, smooth as I possibly can get it. So I'm scraping down the sides if I need to. And I see a bowl of cream cheese at the top. I'm waiting for that to fall down to the bottom and get incorporated in. There it goes. There we go.
Now, while we're getting that as smooth as we possibly can, I'm going to add texture to the dip by dicing the remainder of the trout. So again, I'm gonna save the skins for my dog. She's gonna be super excited with me. Your dog eats pretty well. My dog does eat pretty well, actually. <laughs> the benefits of being a chef, I guess. <laughs> but you know, it was just gonna go in the garbage anyway, so. I figure, why not give her a little treat? No, great idea. It's like dog candy. It is like dog candy. You're absolutely right. I mean, I bought some, you know, fish skins for, the, for them one time, and I, I was kind of outraged with how expensive they were. And I said, oh, I can actually make these at home with just getting the fish and skinning it and doing it my way. So that's what I started they're doing, happy. and they're very yeah. happy. Might as well use everything, right? Absolutely. All right. So now when you cut this, the trout, I just go in lengthwise as thin as I possibly can get it. A sharp knife is very important. Uh, you see I'm wearing gloves. Uh, it's not that I, I you know, it, the, the trout and any smoked fish just leaves um, an odor on your hands because of the oils and everything in it. So just in the spirit of not having stinky hands, I like to wear gloves, but you don't have to if you don't want to. I'm just dicing it all up. Okay. So I have my texture. That one had the bone in it. Okay. So now I have my the trout dip itself. Spatula that out. So this can be made a day ahead of time, if not two days ahead of time, um, if you're you know prepping for a party. Same thing with the soup. You can also make that ahead of time. I would make the rum buttercream the day of, just because um, at times it, it can deflate on itself and it's not really, it's like whipped cream. So you never really make whipped cream too far in advance. So now I'm gonna take my diced trout and then I'm gonna take some greenery. So I'm gonna take my green onions And I'm going to take my parsley that I chopped. I like to use a flat parsley. Um, I just think it's cho it chops easier. It, it's a little bit um, not as potent in flavor as a curly parsley. And then I'm going to fold it and mix it all together. A question came in on the skin for the dogs. Mm -hmm. You um, bake that? You don't give it to them just as is? Correct. I bake it and dry it out so it becomes uh, crispier. Because if it doesn't, then it's... Um, it's almost too uh, elasticy. Yeah, it would be hard to eat. So yes. it's almost like giving them a little potato chip. Yeah, yeah, a fish potato chip. Then I'll take my dip and I'll transfer it over to a nice, pretty bowl. I like to use the blue bowl for the for the seafood aspect. Get it all in there. Okay, so now the finishing touch on this is going to be the black pepper. So then you just put a little bit of some fresh cracked black pepper on top, which that's a salt one, should have checked that earlier. And you just put black pepper right on top. And then you're gonna serve with the gluten-free crackers that we're gonna make now. Put that right over there for everyone to view. Okay, so now we're gonna make the cracker. Now, while I hadn't let it rest for a full 15 minutes, that's still okay. Um, I'm going to roll it out on here. So this does take a little care. 
and a little time when you're working with the dough. So I'm not going to roll all of it out. Just like I said, just in a spirit of time, I just want to show you what the process looks like. Now I'm trying to get a very thin dough here. Okay. So I'm going to take a little bit of my gluten-free flour, sprinkle it down on my work surface. I flattened it out as much as I can. Now you can use plastic wrap if you want to go over it with it, or you can go straight on it. I'm going to use a little plastic wrap to kind of help move things along for myself. And you want it to be about a, an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch in, in thickness. Okay. So the thicker it is, you're, it's going to take a little bit longer to cook and it's not going to be as crackery as you want it to be. It's going to be more, um, kind of like a like chewy texture on the inside. Not bad, just, just a little different. And what I've noticed over um, the multiple times that I've made these crackers is that I get a, a bit of each of them throughout the process. Cause depending upon how even I roll my dough, I try not to sweat about it and just kind of say, okay, it's all good. Um, if I find that I have a thicker piece when I'm cutting them, I will um, just push it down with my hand a little bit more. Okay. So the coolest part about this is the rusticness of the cut. So I just take them and I just cut lines down them. And then I just cut the other way. Nothing too fancy. I want to kind of create pieces that um, are good for dipping and for eating. So as you can see, I didn't go through that last piece. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to transfer them. I gently take my knife, put them onto my parchment lined paper. I'm using a small tray. This recipe actually is for two half trays or one full tray, one full sheet tray. For the flour, do you mix your own flour there at Burton's Grill? No, we don't. We, we partner with um, a gluten-free company that, that makes it for us or makes it for a bunch of people. And we just use it as well. Yeah. Um, I just, I recently just switched um, because I wasn't, we weren't enjoying our, um, seven layer chocolate cake. So we have a, a seven layer chocolate cake dessert that we feed to um, everybody, whether you are gluten-free or not gluten-free um, and people don't even know. And um, sometimes the um, certain gluten-free flours have a higher alkalinity in it. And I wasn't enjoying the flavor profile of that. So we tried some other gluten-free flours and we landed on one that we really like. Is that available for the- It right sure is, it's available. Um, in many, many different markets. Good to know. Yeah. And uh, there's been a uh, question about the cake flour. Is that a different blend or a different brand or? Um, I use the same brand, but it is a little bit of a different blend. Yeah. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm going, I like to season my crackers. You can season them with just salt. Um, I like to use a little bit of, a, of an everything seasoning on there. So you have poppy, sesame seed, um, salt, granulated garlic, onion, um, and that's all on there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take um, olive oil, lightly brush each one of my pieces, because this is really the glue that's going to make it stick. If you don't do this, then you're going to have a problem. I've also taken some of this and have rolled it into my dough when I'm making that so that the seasoning is all the way throughout it. That's another unique um, flavor profile uh, if you're looking for something different along those lines too. Someone asked if we can use canned smoked trout. Um, I have never done that, but I'm, it seems like you could do that. That wouldn't be a problem. I think the only thing with me not seeing that is um, the dicing of it. And if you're going to get the different texture. Um, so I'm not, if you have a, if it has a good texture to it, that it's not all mushy, then yeah, I would say no problem at all on that. Oh, good to know. Thank you. Now you want to be generous with your seasoning because um, like I said, it has a tendency to fall off. And then the poppies always kind of come through as the top is what you see. So then this is going to go into a 350 degree convection oven or a 400 degree plain oven. And I'm going to cook it for about 15 minutes. If it's thinner, then I would do it for a little bit less. And when they come out, you'll have nice golden brown crackers that pair wonderfully with 
the trout dip. So another thing that we're gonna, we can um, move on to is going to be our butterscotch pudding. So I have already heated up the cream and the milk. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my eggs, remainder of the milk, brown sugar, and cornstarch. I'm gonna bring them all over here. So I take the, the cornstarch and the milk first. And as you know, anything that you mix with um, cornstarch um, can be tricky at times. So I'm going to mix that first to get all the clumps out. That's one cup of milk in here. Now I'm gonna add my four eggs. My brown sugar. I'm gonna mix these all together. As you can see, I'm not holding the whisk up top. I actually hold the whisk down low when I'm doing this, just gives me a little bit more control of it. Um, I mean, I'm using a restaurant size whisk, so I don't know if anybody has this size at home. A smaller whisk would be better. Um, but you can see the nice color that I'm getting right now. So now since I have eggs in here and I have a warm milk pot over here, I warmed the milk and cream until it had a skim on the top of it. I'm going to slowly add this in because I do not want to cook my eggs. Okay. So this is, this is a liaison. Once you add more in, it's more forgiving, kind of like when you're making a, a vinaigrette, you have to go slow with the oil in the beginning. And then as you add more oil, it becomes a little bit more forgiving for you. All right. Now I don't have to add all the, all the milk and cream to it, just the majority of it. Cause then what I'm going to do is I'm going to transfer it back into this pot and I'm going to bring it back to my stove top. Now this is where it gets tricky because if you do this at a fast rate, um, the cornstarch reacts at 185 degrees. So once that reacts at 185 degrees, it's gonna automatically thicken. Now I'm gonna keep an eye on this and I'm gonna stir it as frequently as I possibly can, pretty much consistently, because that's gonna get me the smooth texture that I'm looking for. If it's not, if, it, if you go too fast, the cornstarch kind of coagulates and you don't have a very smooth butterscotch pudding. Um, to pair with the pudding is um, I make a gluten-free cookie. So I had pre-made the cookies because, um, like I said, there's just a lot to do in a little bit of time. So with the cookies, um, one of the really important steps is to, once you've added the, I use brown sugar and regular sugar, and I cream that together with my butter. Then when you add the eggs in there, you whip the eggs for, you know, a good eight to 10 minutes because that's creating air into the cookie and you're going to get a lighter, fluffier cookie. If that's what you like, then that's how you achieve that. If you want it to be um, more dense and chewy, don't whip that air in there, okay? But I will say that a light, fluffy cookie is very delicious. <laughs> so I'm just gonna bring this up a little bit. And then, um, you know, there's a bunch of different ways to make butterscotch pudding and different, you know, artificial flavors you can use. As you can see, there's really no artificial flavor in here. I'm gonna add my salt in. Um, I use real butter and real scotch at the end. So once it gets to the desired thickness, we will then add in our butter and our scotch. I use an unsalted butter, okay? Um, just because I'm, I don't want it to be too salty of a flavor profile. This is my husband's favorite dessert that I've ever made um, at Burton's. He's going to be excited when I get to bring some of the home to him today. <laughs> We've had a lot of people asking about the brands of flowers to use. Some people have said they've wasted so much money trying all different kinds of flowers. We're not really allowed to say the brand on this webinar, but we will post it on our recipes that are going to be on the NCA website. So um, 
I hope that will take care of all those questions that are coming in. And I totally agree. There are so many recipes that I tried with so many different flowers until I finally got a few that I really liked working with. So hang in there, everybody. I appreciate your questions. Yeah, and Lee, I agree. You know, I, I met a woman at the at our Red Heat Tavern um, on Saturday night who said she's wasted so much money trying to try different breads. And um, so it is nice to kind of reach out to the community and ask what have, what have you found preferable? But really at the end of the day, we're each our own individual and we have our own individual likes and dislikes. So some people might have a different preference in how they like their, their style of bread. So I think that's really important that, you know, there are recommendations, but um, it is really what you enjoy. Yeah, they don't really come with an absolute, this is what you love because each one of us, as you say, like different things. Right. Somebody did uh, ask that they can't have alcohol. What would be a substitute for, I think it was rum that you used earlier? Mm, that's a good question. I don't, I don't really have a substitute for that right now. Um, let me think about that and I can, I can let you know once, the, um, once we're done and get it into the chat or into the recipe when we um, post those. So I'm coming to a nice thickness right now and I'm gonna pull it and take my heat off. I'm gonna add my butter in. Now, another important step right here is when you cool it, I pour it into a container. I'm gonna add my scotch. This up. So I have a, a, a sheet pan here that I'm going to pour it into. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a piece of, piece of um, plastic wrap and lay it flat right on top, okay? Now what this is gonna do is it's gonna create um, no crust. Oh, that one didn't work. Let me get another one on there for us. So if you have a, um, if you like the film on top of your puddings, don't put this on. But if you want a nice smooth pudding, definitely put this on. And then yeah, I just put this in my refrigerator to cool down. I've had the same issue with gravy. That yes. Let it sit without the top. It gets sort of a thick crust on it that's not, really palatable, at least for gravy. What uh, would we be able to um, to make this for a glute, um, I'm sorry, a um, dairy-free pudding? Yeah, you know, um, we had somebody try it and they tried it with um, a, a variety of milks. One was almond milk and coconut milk and then another one was 100% coconut milk and they preferred the almond milk and the coconut milk mixture together and they said it worked wonderfully. Oh, and this is, yeah, you know, yeah, this yeah. is one that's been cooled down already. So you can see the viscosity is nice and uh, full. Now what I've done was I've taken the cookies and I make a big batch of cookie, okay? And then when the cookie is the cookie dough is done, I wrap it in parchment paper and then I put it in plastic. Then I put it in my freezer and I have cookie batter for whenever I need it so that I can just slice and go. And all the hard work was done in the beginning. So then I, if I don't use it all, I wrap it back up, I put it back in the freezer. And this is good for about six months in your freezer, as long as you have the plastic wrap on it and you're not transferring the flavors to it. Um, but, you know, this cookie dough doesn't really last longer than a few weeks in my freezer. <laughs> so um, it's also good if you, you know, when you're making the cookie doughs in the recipe, it says to roll them into a ball. If you roll them into a ball, they're going to give you a, um, a higher cookie. If you cut them thinner, they're going to give you a thinner, crispier cookie. So again, just having an understanding of how that works is going to be really important. Um, what we have over here presented is more of a trifle where I take the cookies and I crumble them up and then I layer them with the butterscotch pudding, a little bit of um, whipped cream, a little bit more cookie, then more butterscotch pudding and then a little bit more uh, whipped cream on top for a garnish. And I crumble the cookie on top as well. If you want to, you can just serve it as a pudding in a cup with the cookie as a garnish. That's always um, a, a nice treat for everyone too. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to whoopie pies. So we have, um, I mentioned the gluten-free um, chocolate cake that we serve at Burton's Grill. Well, 
at Red Heat Tavern, we serve whoopie pies. And um, I've been working on developing a gluten-free whoopie pie for Red Heat. And I'm glad that this um, seminar came so that we could do it because we made a very good whoopie pie with the cake batter that we have at Burton's Grill. So we have these really cute, fun whoopie pie molds here. And what we do is I take um, my batter. I whip this by hand. So I take my, um, my gluten-free flour, my sugar, cocoa powder, baking powder, baking soda, kosher salt. Um, I put that in one bowl as my dry ingredients. And then in my separate bowl, I add buttermilk, um, vegetable oil, an egg, vanilla extract, a touch of ven uh, white vinegar. And then we use um, coffee. So you can use instant coffee or brewed coffee, um, but that adds a, a nice richness to it as well um, for the flavor profile. Um, and if you wanted to substitute the buttermilk out, you can use a um, unsweetened uh, coconut milk and then add a vinegar or um, lemon juice to that to kind of make that the buttermilk, the sour aspect of that. So then in these pan, in these little um, molds, you don't have to put any, um, what is it called? Uh, spray. So there has to be no oil, no spray. These pop right out. So I'm going to take a tablespoon. And I made this batter yesterday and it's great. I also made these whoopie pie shells and I froze them and then I um, thawed them out. And those are also great. So one of the things that I think is really forgiving about some of the gluten-free cooking is the fact that you can utilize your freezer um, to store some of these um, items if you need to, because you don't want to have to make them again. So as you're loading up for the holiday season, it's really fun to get ahead of it and put these in the freezer and then be done. These are a really great treat for the kids. And then these go in a 350 degree oven and they bake fast. So they can bake anywhere from uh, six to eight minutes is what I was cooking them at, at a 350 degree convection oven. And then when they come out of the oven, they're right here in the silicone molds. And then you just kind of take your hands and then pop them out and they're, they all come out very easily, just like that. And then over here for you, I had already taken some out and I have a, the whoopie pie filling. So we use fluff and then we put softened butter in it to help lighten it up. Um, some people don't add the butter and I find that overly sweet and sticky. So that's why we, we complement it with some butter. Um, at this point, you can add your flavor. So I, we're doing seasonal whoopie pies at Red Heat. We're currently using a raspberry jam that goes in it. Um, and for this um, seasonal one, I added pumpkin pie spice to it. Um, so you have a little bit of that um, ginger and cinnamon and, and allspice flavor that, that just sits on your tongue. Really nice. Now, when you're working with fluff, it's really um, very helpful to understand that if you put a little bit of a pan spray in your measuring cup and on your spoons that you're using, it really helps them um, come off much easier. Now, less is more in this filling, okay? So just like I did a tablespoon of batter, I'm gonna do a tablespoon, if not a little bit less of the filling, okay? Um, you can keep this in your refrigerator for two weeks if you want. I did that and it was still delicious. Um, I have made these, pre-made them and kept them in, in a sealed container in my refrigerator. And again, I really liked them on day three after I ate them, I thought they were great. If you see, I'm using a two spoon method, okay? Some people, if you have like one of those little tablespoon cookie dough scoops, that also works well. Then you just put your lid on, press it down a little bit, and then you're good to go. I like that they're small and petite because sometimes the really big ones are just almost overpowering in flavor for me. Um, and then as you can see, we dusted the tops over here with a um, powdered sugar and a, um, uh, what am I trying to say? Sifter. Um, you can put a little piece of paper there if you want to get the perfect line. You can put a fork down on there and then lift the fork up and then you have a really cute design on there. Um, so those are some applications for that. Um, yes. These are beautiful. And then the last piece that I, did, I wanted to just touch base on at the very end is the antipasti um, platter that you can make. 
I love these for parties because there's always something for everybody on this tray. And I think that, you know, as you're looking at what you can put on here, it's, it's really fairly easy to assemble one as long as you know what you're looking for. So depending upon how many people you have over or what their flavor, what their, what their likes are, I would pick two to three different um, salamis and you just want a variety of meats. So sometimes you can have um, a sopressata, which is a little spicier. You can have prosciutto. You can have a hard salami. Um, sometimes they're wrapped in uh, black pepper. Um, but most importantly, I do source ones that are gluten-free on the label, um, just because I find that's important with the different seasonings that people use in there. After that, I then choose my cheeses. I love a triple crema soft cheese. So that's why I have this one right over here. This is one of my favorite cheeses. It eats just like butter. Um, then I'll have a, a harder cheese and that's uh, the manchego. I went for a 12 month manchego in the center. And then I have a comte, which has a little bit more of a robust flavor on the backside. Um, and then, to, then you also are gonna wanna have some garnishes that accent that. Um, I like to choose olives. Um, I like to also choose like a bruschetta tomato spread that people can build their own um, bruschettas on there. I have some pepidou peppers on there to add a little bit of spice. And then you can jazz it up with honey, nuts, fruit. It's really what you're looking for in flavor profiles. I have some marinated mushrooms on there as well. Um, and then I would serve them with the gluten-free crackers I made, or I would make some gluten-free crostinis from a gluten-free baguette um, that I would cut, you know, half inch, quarter inch, depending upon what thickness you want, a little bit of oil on there. I put a touch of seasoning on there as well, salt, pepper, um, granulated garlic. And then I, I put those in the oven, 350 degrees for about another eight to 10 minutes until they're golden brown. Um, and then people can really build their own um, bruschettas. I also have some artichokes on there um, because it, it's, it's really fun to see what different flavor profiles people like to eat. Um, but it's really about just being creative and then making sure that it's presented beautifully because um, that's really what people eat with their eyes. And when they see it, they just can't resist coming to, to eat it. So I enjoy having the antipasti platters um, for, my, for my guests because it's a little grazing snack for everybody. I think they're a great idea because you really are touching on all different kinds of flavors. There's got to be something in there that someone enjoys. So you're hitting all the different kinds of taste buds that are out there, I think. And then that wraps it up for all the recipes today, Lee. Thank you. You did a great job. You must be exhausted. <laughs> I'm, it's fun. This is what I love to do. I know. And you do it so well. Thank you so much. Um, the butterscotch pudding. I don't, I missed the end, whether I got pulled away for a minute. Um, how did you serve that? Okay. So I served that. Let me pull it over here for you. I serve that in a little trifle dish. Okay. So oh, I have yes. chopped cookies on the bottom. Then I have a layer of butterscotch. Then I have more cookies, then some whipped cream and then more butterscotch, touch more whipped cream and then a little cookie crumble. You can also put it in a small glass just with the butterscotch as a purist would go like my husband and then put a little whipped cream on top and then the cookie in top as a garnish. That's a great idea. I like both ideas. That's great. Terrific. Yeah, it's also nice if you do it on a large format trifle dish too. So that, that yep. represents really nicely on a dessert table. No, I think that's great. Um, I was trying to see if we have um, one more question coming in here. Oh, um, yes, I know someone said gluten-free pan sprays. Um, but I guess one thing I would worry about is they do have the pan sprays with flour you don't want to get that one. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. I source out a gluten-free pan spray um, for, for the restaurants. Yeah. Um, I also use just a little bit of a vegetable oil sometimes on my, on my spoons. Yeah, I know I've, I've seen people put um, some of the vegetable oils in a spray can, you know, just a little spray drizzle, like you would just be spraying water, but you would be spraying oil. Correct. And that works as well as, and much cheaper than buying uh, the spray pan too. Yeah, they make those aerosols. We use those um, to coat our croutons actually. So we put extra olive oil in there and then spray our croutons down. It's a great idea. I like that. And I like the idea of putting parchment paper that someone recommended because I thought, well, maybe the pan would be a little bit easier to clean I don't know. Yeah, I know. 
<laughs> I remember when I first went home after culinary school and started cooking in my house uh, with my mom. She goes, you do know there's no dishwashers here, right? <laughs> I, I was like, yes, I forget about that. because I was like, thinking, yes, you have people. <laughs> we have people. Very, very important people. No um, kidding. Yeah, very sure. But um, yeah, that's always my thing, with, especially when you're entertaining is how can I have everything cleaned up before anybody comes in the door so I don't have to be doing it late at night or whatever. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's why I think like showing some of these recipes that you can make the day before and have it ready to go is, is super important. It's critical. It really is critical. Otherwise, I'm not sure you really enjoy the company. By the time they come in, you're exhausted. Absolutely. Yeah. And you don't always want to be over the stovetop while you're, while you're entertaining, you know? So part of it is being able to sit down and enjoy the company that you invited over. Yes, exactly. Exactly. No, I think that's great. <laughs> We're going to be doing Thanksgiving for the first year in a condo, um, except the same amount of people are coming. So I'm trying to figure out how to do that. But some of your ideas are so great because it can be done earlier. And then the day of, there's not quite as much to do, which I think is important. Very true. Very true. Yeah. Uh, I don't have any more questions that uh, are coming in. So I think we're good. So um, unless someone else sends any more in, I think we're all set. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me today. Oh, thank you so much. This has been really wonderful and I'm drooling. <laughs> so thank you. And thank take you. Care. Yeah, you bet. Bye -bye. Uh, I just want to say that... Um, that at the end, everything has been taped. So you can go on the NCA website for all of our webinars. And please consider a generous donation to Feeding Gluten Free Initiative at nationalceliac.org. Thank you. And until then, stay well and have a happy and healthy Thanksgiving. See you later.